I know last week I said that uh, that was the last message of the Famous Last Words series, but I was mistaken. Uh, there's one more, and I'm just titling this the encore. How many like when you go to a great concert and they come back out for that encore, you know what I mean? It's, uh, yeah, and, and so the encore. And actually, when I began contemplating this series, I never threw out all these seven or eight messages, really got to the passage that I was thinking about or contemplating on when I began the series. And so I realized, okay, I can't finish till I go back to where I was supposed to start, actually. So this is the encore. Let me pray before I start. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I just come to you this morning. Just thankful, Lord. Just full of joy this morning, Father God. Just full of you this morning, Lord. Fill us with you, your mind, your Christ, your Holy Spirit, your truth. As today, as it were, you are doing a, a reset on New City Church as we are building on top of building and we're building on what was old and building on what is new and that's, that's people as, as well as resources, building on what was old and building on what is new. You're resetting the foundation, bringing us back to a reboot of the the foundations that you want us to build on. Help us in this season. Help every church in this season that, that names your name, Jesus. Help us, Lord God, to stand firmly on your truth, firmly on your word. We thank you for it right now. Help me, Lord God, once again. I'm simply your trumpet. You play the song. You blow the wind. I will make the noise. And I thank you this morning. Come, Holy Spirit. You're already here, but fill us, Lord God, overflowing this morning. I'm thankful for people that's hungry for your word, Lord God. That, that, that as the Bible said, they, 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 they welcome your word. Bless us now with your word in the precious name of Jesus. And the church said, Amen. If you recall in the first message, I know everybody was not here, but the first message of this series, before, we, before I started and anything else, I brought a message, you know, I was going to begin with the, the first message, Jesus loves you, and then I realized we need a, a, a message first, a realization that Jesus is, he actually is. And in that message, if you recall, we talked about dispensations. We got into some Bible study, this has been a heavy and steady, heavy and doctrine series, and it's going to continue in that, in that path today. We talked about dispensations. We expounded on the fact that, that, that Jesus, that God's work in the earth is a, is, is a progressive work of, of dispensations. In other words, they're, they're divinely appointed uh, order or age. They're, they're defined by divinely set periods of time and seasons when God does things in the earth. They're set, they're boundaries of dispensations. We talked about Jesus' famous last three words on the cross in that first message when he said, it is finished. If you recall, we said it is finished. And his time of walking as a human on the earth was finished. His time of suffering and dying for our sins was finished. But, but what, what Jesus was actually declaring, he was declaring the finish of a dispensation. Jesus was declaring, this dispensation is over. That dispensation was the dispensation of the revelation of Christ the revelation of who I am, the person of Jesus Christ, was finished. The fulfillment of prophecy of Scripture from, from the Torah, the first five books of the Bible recorded by Moses, throughout the Old Testament, 350 plus prophecies from Genesis to Malachi, recorded by judges and kings and major and minor prophets and, of Israel over a period of 1,500 years for telling the coming of a savior, the coming of a Messiah, a good shepherd, a mediator, a judge, a king forever, Emmanuel with us, foretelling over 1,500 years of prophecy, over 350 mentions in the Bible. He said, now that has come, that this patient has come and is now finished. 
a dispensation that began with a virgin birth in Bethlehem and it completed on a cross of punishment, torture, and dying in Jerusalem. And at that moment, uh, 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 the, the, the dispensation of the revelation of Christ was finished. And listen, and at that same moment, at the same moment began the next dispensation of the redemptive work of God in the earth. At that moment began the dispensation of grace. One dispensation of ended, the dispensation of the revelation of Jesus ended, and now began the dispensation of grace. Grace. You remember when uh, Pastor Richard talked about God's love, he talked about the two-sided coin. Anybody remember that message? Just a, just a great message. When the Bible talks about grace, it's another one of those two-sided coins in the Bible. When you look at the Bible, you see an explanation of grace, and you also see a definition of grace. The two sides of the same coin, and you can't have one and leave the other. You can't grind off one side and keep the one side. I want to talk a little bit about grace this morning. It's a beautiful word. It's a beautiful thing. How many are glad for grace? Come on, this ain't no trick question. Come on, yeah, no. <laughs> if you want to find an explanation of grace, one of the best scriptures is Romans 3, 20 through 24. And Paul wrote, therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. A great explanation of grace and then there's another side of the same coin that's recorded in, in Titus 2, 11 through 14, which is, 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 I believe, the best definition of grace you will find in, in the Bible. And Paul wrote in this letter to Titus, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us, or some, some uh, translations said training us, that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearance of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. It seems almost contradictory. We have this grace freely given for salvation that no one can earn, but the other side of the coin is that this grace that brings salvation that has appeared to all men also teaches us or trains us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, live soberly, righteously, and godly, sell you for good works. Which is it, Pastor? I'm telling you, it's both. It's both. Grace saves and grace teaches. Why would God save you and leave you in the same sewer? No. No. He won't do that. He loves you too much. Grace saves. Grace teaches. Grace. The dispensation of the revelation of Christ is over. We are now living in the dispensation of grace. And if you look at the Bible, the, the, the beginning of the dispensation of grace also marked what Jesus called the beginning of the end times. The beginning of the end times. You see, what God called the end times have been going on now for about 2,000 years, but that's a, that's a blink in heaven. But the time of his coming is nearer than it was before. Jesus knows the time is near. And Satan knows the time is near. 
And that's why there, there, there's a struggle raging more and more in the earth today. He said, don't be dismayed by the things that you see today. Satan knows the time is near, and he is raging. Jesus knows the time is here, and he is praying. That is why there's a heightened struggle today for the souls of men and women. And that is why the Bible tells us in so many structures, in so many scriptures, in this, in this dispensation of grace, Paul writes in Ephesians 6, put on the whole armor of God. In this dispensation of grace, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the, of the, of the, of the devil. In this dispensation of grace, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but principalities and against powers. And the rulers against the rulers in darkness of this age, spiritual hosts of witnesses in the heavenly places. In, the, in this dispensation of grace, he says, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the evil day and have it done all. Stand in this dispensation of grace. You know, I, the men's conference was off the chain. For those of you who were there, I see many faces over there. Can I get an amen, amen? And it was powerful. It may have been, I don't know if it's just the season we're coming out of, where everybody's coming out of the cave in the basement, you know, and guys are coming out, you know, and, and coming together. But it was, uh, it was a very, 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 very powerful time. And God's timing is perfect. Our, our featured speaker couldn't make it. He was sick. He came down with an asymptomatic COVID. And then so he can, and Pastor Richard Schaub came in, and that was no accident by God. My God. My God. Oh, no. My God. And the theme of the conference was prevail. Prevail in this dispensation of grace. Prevailing is only a necessity if there is an enemy that must be conquered. Can I get an amen? If, if, if there's no enemy, there's nothing to prevail against, right? So prevail, prevail speaks that there's an enemy to be conquered by men and women in this dispensation of grace. In that first message, Jesus is, that was uh, seven or eight weeks ago, we went through seven letters from, written to the church and written to you and me from, from post-incarnate Jesus. In other words, after the cross, Jesus. Seven letters that were, were written to seven prototype churches that also represented seven prototype Christians. And in these letters, when we went through them, we, we saw both commendations and we also saw warnings. But what I loved about each letter, whether it was a commendation or a loving warning, they all ended with a prize, a great reward that Christ promised to the, to the victor, promised to the conqueror, promised, promised to the winner, promised to the one who, who would prevail in this age of grace. to the one who prevails. And I want to take a close look, not, not at the letters, but just the promises. Because sometimes we glaze over them. Sometimes we're so shocked by the warnings that we miss the promises of God. In that letter, he said, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. In that letter, he said, the one who conquers, the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. In that letter, he said, to the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. How many know your name is not your final name? In that letter, he said, the, the, the one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, 
and he small h. That means you will rule them with an iron, a rod of iron, as when the earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. I don't even know what that means. He who has an ear. Jesus wrote, the prototype churches, the prototype, prototype Christians, the one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He wrote to you and me, the, the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. And he writes to you and me, the, the, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. I think that's my favorite of all. I will grant, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear. To the one who conquers, who conquers he said, he, he's speaking into this dispensation of grace. And he said, to the one who conquers, promises. Thank you, Jesus for the dispensation of grace. Where would I be without not only grace that saves, but, but, but grace that trained me to make better choices, to live a better life, to avoid evil to the best of my ability most of the time. <laughs> grace is precious to me. You should thank God that he gave birth to you in the dispensation of grace. Thank you, Jesus. However, let's look forward. There is a day, just as the dispensation of the revelation of Christ came to an end, it was finished. There is a day when the dispensation of grace will also be finished when it will end, and that day comes individually, and it also comes on the whole world. That, that, that end of this, this dispensation of grace comes individually when, any, if, when someone dies rejecting Christ as their Lord and Savior. For them, that is the end of the dispensation of grace. And this dispensation of grace comes, the day comes upon the world when Jesus returns from his bride. When you see that flashing in the eastern sky and it's coming, that is the end of the dispensation of grace. On that day, just as when the, when the end of the dispensation of the revelation of Christ ended, the dispensation of grace began, when the dispensation of grace ended, is now comes the dispensation of judgment. Come on, we're resetting the foundation. Come on, church. We're talking about this faith. We're talking about our Jesus. We're talking about the things that are to be, the things that the Bible says, that as we live our day and day life, we must not forget that these things are so. That is why this series. The dispensation of grace, that a day will come for every believer and the entire world when the dispensation of grace finishes, closes, as much as precious as it is, as loving as it is, as beautiful as it is, it comes to an end, and then immediately following comes the dispensation of judgment. That Jesus prophesied to his disciples. In last week, week's message, sitting on the Mount of Olives, when he was talking about all these things, all these things, and he prophesied that, that, that end of grace and the beginning of judgment. When he said in Matthew 24, 27 through 30, he said, For as, as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. together. 
And he says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be dark and the moon will not give us light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. He says, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. They will mourn because this is the end of the dispensation of grace. That we end. Because even if you're going to heaven, you're going to be aware that some people... And it said the world of mourn. They rejoice that the kid is coming. So the world will mourn at his second. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and glory, the end of grace. You see, when Jesus came to the earth and gave his life on the cross, the wrath of God against sin did not go away. You were redeemed. You were saved. A price was paid. He, he drank of the cup for us so that, the, so that you could be let go. For those of you, he's not one that's mine. One that's mine will be lost. Not one that, that the Bible said that, that you gave me will be lost. The beginning of judgment. Come on, let's read some more Bible. How many love the Bible? You might need a glass of water with this one. Revelation 20, 11 through 15. It says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was, was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Remember he said, for those who overcome will not be hurt by the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Come on, we, we, we need to come back to some foundation, church. We need to come back to some truth. The day will come where every man born in the world will stand before the throne of God and the Bible said the books will be open because they're full. And everything that you ever did, good, bad, or ugly, will be presented before you. How does that feel? And after all that has been reminded to you, of all the stupid stuff you did, all the sinful stuff you did, and the good stuff, now another book will be checked. One book called the Book of Life. And if your name is found in that book, no matter what is in the other books, you will not be hurt at all by the second death. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the truth in this day and age that we live it in. That's why the gospel must be preached. That's why, that's, that's why we must, the number one priority for us must be the souls of men and women. The dispensation of judgment. And thank God it's a brief dispensation. The, the, the Bible describes it as a day. A day. Because then comes a, a, a next disposition. It's not over church. There's a final disposition. After the, the, after the disposition of judgment, comes the disposition of heaven, the new Jerusalem. What is that? It's, it's the restoration of the original plan of God. It goes all the way back to Genesis. It's the new Genesis. Except this time, it's not just two, Adam and Eve. It's, it's, it's the, the, the thousands upon thousands upon thousands, the Bible says. 
Now again, the tree of life. Now again, eternal life. Now again. The Bible says in Revelation 21, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. And then I, John, saw the, the holy city. This is what New City Church gets its name. The holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the, the former things have passed away. And as, as I've said over and over, this dispensation of grace will be the former things. The dispensation of judgment will be the former. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new, not some things, all things new. That's why last week, all these things that we look at got to go. Because I'm going to make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. Here's another, It is done. Some translations suggest, as he said on the cross, It is finished. He says, It is finished. Another dispensation is finished. It is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega the beginning and the end, and I will give up the fountain of water freely to him who thirsts. He who, shall, who overcomes shall inherit all these things. I love that. He who prevails shall inherit all, he who conquers shall inherit all these things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son, but the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, abominable the, the, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, idolaters, Come on, this doesn't read the church too well. And all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The Bible, back to the Word of God. The whole Word. Not just the stuff that's nice. We're sitting around being nice and people are going to hell. There is no gospel of Jesus Christ without repentance of sin. The cross for what? Grace for what? How many love the word of God this morning? You know, no matter what I think I said, no matter what I throw at this church, y'all say, if it's the word of God, y'all say hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. How many of y'all love Jesus? Come on. Come on. You know what I, one thing I love about Jesus? He doesn't spare me the truth. Ignorance of the faith is calling, causing many believers to stumble, fail. I was going to end this series with the last worship team is telling me what time it is. Look at them. Yeah, yeah. What time is it, Pastor Wilson? Got time? Slow it down. Okay. When I when I began this series, I had the last chapter. You know, when I said the last words, I was thinking the last chapter, the last word. I mean, I, and, and that's why I would look when I began this series, and then the Holy Spirit began to you know, take me back to this and that and this and that and this and that. But I just want to end this series reading that last the last word. Now this is the last word. <laughs> of this series, the, the famous last words, the, the end of the Bible that we so rarely get to when we're doing our devotion time. The, the, the last, the last of the last in Revelation 22. I'm going to start in verse 6. And this is the discourse going on between John 
an angel messenger and Jesus, the post incarnate Jesus. And I'm going to leave it to you to pick up who's speaking when. And then, and then, then he said to me, but this is the angel. Then John is saying, then the angel said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Behold, I am coming quickly. It's Jesus speaking. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Now I, John, saw and heard these things, and when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he, the angel, said to me, See that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. And he said to me, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. In other words, he who, who rejects, there's nothing you can do. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. Don't you pass judgment, but you gotta. He who is filthy, let him be filthy. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. He says, and behold, I am coming with me. This is Jesus speaking. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And he says, blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life, the new Genesis, and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside, again, he says, are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things. Where? In the church. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star, and the spirit and the bride say, come, the Holy Spirit and the church. We should be saying, come. And let him who hears, that's you out there in the street, say, come. And let him who thirsts come, whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, that this is rough. If anyone asks these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the prophecy of this book, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things that are written in this book. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. And John says, after hearing all these things, he says, amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. He did, 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 they, after hearing all these difficult things and all these, even I, I imagine John is trying to process and say, oh, "What?" Yeah, I, I, and then he just comes to this resolution. Even so, come. And the last, the last, very last verse in the Bible: "The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ." be with you all. Amen. I always look at the first verse and the last verse of the Bible. The first verse of the Bible, Genesis 1-1, it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And then the last verse, 22-21, Revelation, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And here we are, we're living in the middle 
we're in the middle of, of, of Jesus created the, the heavens and the earth, and we're in the middle of that, and, and, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ come, even so come. Living in the middle, in the dispensation of grace, and, and, and this dispensation, this dispensation of grace, there's a war raging. If you haven't figured it out yet, it's wake you up. Some of us need slapping around. Wake up, wake up. So full of the TV and social media. Wake up. Full of all that and empty on the word. Wake up. There's a war raging for souls, and Jesus is calling his church to a task. And the task is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus is saying the spirit and the bride say, come. Come, not cancel, come. And let him who ears hear say, come. And let him who thirsts, come. And whoever desires this of all volunteer army, let him take the water of life. As I was sitting in my recliner this morning, this really came to me this morning, and I was praying. And I was thinking about, how do I pray? How do we pray in this, in this dispensation of God? How, how do we pray now? And of course, the Lord's Prayer, well, not of course, but the Lord's Prayer came to mind. And there's a pattern set. This dispensation of grace and, 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 and having this, mel this message chewing in me all, uh, all, all day yesterday, it was, it was kind of quick preparation because I was so sick last week. Jesus said, when you pray, you, you pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And then you pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. And then we pray, give us this day our daily bread. And it, it, it was a, a shifting in my understanding, a shifting in my priority that today, typically, we do not pray in that godly order. Today, mostly, you and me come, and the first thing that we pray is give us this day our daily bread. And he said, no, pray first, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On the earth as it is in heaven, come, Jesus, come. If we get to that at all. And the Holy Spirit asked me, which promises do you value the most? The promises of money or job or healing or peace in the world? Or which, which, which promises do you, do, 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 uh, uh, do you value most in your prayer, in my life, in my mind? Do I value most the, the promises of all these things in the world? Or do I value the promises that are not of this world? Shift. Disruptive. Here we go again. A shift of priorities. Prayer. My prayer is for me and for you is that we would discipline ourselves again to be absolute disciples of Jesus Christ. No small g gods allowed. Promises. Come on, let's stand. We have the salvation prayer. Y'all all right? Y'all all right? Jesus told the soldiers in the high priest guard, you're looking for me. Let those go. Those that his father has given him. The Bible says no one comes to him unless he calls first. There's a whisper of the Holy Spirit in the ear of every unbeliever. Believe. Believe. And there may be someone here today who's drifted from that or never, never grabbed hold of that truth again in the first place. 
especially for you, I want you to pray this prayer out loud. And we all pray it out loud. I pray it out loud because there's some area of my life I drift every week. It's not daily. This grace saves me. Your grace teaches me. Come on, let's say this together. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. I know that I am a sinner, and I repent for my sins. Come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. Today, I have been made new. From this day forward, I will follow you. Come on, can I get an amen in the house? Come on, get an amen in the house.